What's up guys, it's Celeste, and although there has been obviously a lot of progress in the last few years as far as acceptance of trans people and what it means to be trans and things like that, there's still a lot of stigma around it. And one of the things in particular that I still see a lot is people misunderstanding being trans as being a mental illness. The primary place that I still see this a lot is in social media comments especially on YouTube, on other people's videos, and on Instagram, and on Facebook, and things like that. It's usually people who don't actually know that much about gender or psychology, but are sort of, I don't know, armchair psychologists or something, and think that they know what they're talking about. So I wanted to make this video to kind of clarify some things, because I think not all of those people are necessarily malicious, I think maybe they're just misinformed, and hopefully I can sort of clear things up for those people, as well as for people who maybe are accepting of trans people but just don't really understand how mental health fits into it, and then also people who maybe do understand that it's not a mental illness but are looking for resources that they can use to point other people towards this information when they come across people making these kinds of comments. Just a couple of caveats to start with. I'm not a psychologist. I have no real mental health training. I did study behavioral social sciences in college, including a lot of psychology and sociology classes. So I know a little bit about stuff, but I'm not a trained professional as far as mental health treatment or diagnosis or anything like that. However, the things that I'm going to be talking about are not just based on my personal opinion or experience, but are going to be using citations and references that I found from professional health organizations and mental health organizations and things like that. So even if you don't take my word for it, um, the information that I'm giving you comes from people who are professional in these fields and obviously do know something about what they're talking about. And I'll be posting links to all of this in the description as well. The other caveat is, in talking about this, my goal is not to distance being trans from mental illness because mental illness is bad or that there should be a stigma around it. There definitely shouldn't, and um, that's something that I feel very strongly about. But I think part of breaking down stigma on in both of these areas is recognizing what separates them and not just generalizing everything that we don't understand or which is less common in our society as being a mental illness and like writing it off as a mental illness because I don't think that serves trans people or people who have mental illness. I think it's also very important to be aware of the necessity of being really up to date on the latest standards of care and diagnostic criteria and studies and you know basically what mental health and other medical providers are using to treat both trans people and mentally ill people. Because it's very clear from a lot of this, these kind of comments that I'm talking about that the people posting them are not really up to date on current understanding of gender and how it relates to mental health. And to try to be sort of fair on this, it's really only fairly recently that being trans and gender nonconforming has been sort of depathologized and separated from mental illness. Okay, so with all that background out of the way, I'm finally getting to the part that you really came to this video to see, which is why being trans is not a mental illness. There used to be something in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is used by mental health professionals in the United States, which was called Gender Identity Disorder. However, in 2013, the DSM-5 was published and it changed Gender Identity Disorder to Gender Dysphoria. Ahead of the publication, the American Psychiatric Association released a statement about why they made this change, and I'm going to read a couple of excerpts of it for you. It is important to note that gender nonconformity is not in itself a mental disorder. The critical element of gender dysphoria is the presence of clinically significant distress associated with the condition. So in other words, having a gender identity different from the one you are assigned at birth is not a mental illness. It pretty explicitly says that. The mental health aspect of it is the distress or dysphoria that comes about from the incongruence between your gender identity and the one that you were assigned at birth, particularly as far as how other people see you and how you relate to your body. 
This also accounts for trans people who don't experience gender dysphoria, especially physical dysphoria. Having gender dysphoria is not a prerequisite for identifying as trans. The rewording of the criteria also better accounts for people who don't identify as male or female. The language is now more expansive to allow for people all along the gender spectrum. Later in the release, it goes on to say, To get insurance coverage for the medical treatments, individuals need a diagnosis. The Sexual and Gender Identity Disorders Work Group was concerned that removing the condition as a psychiatric diagnosis, as some had suggested, would jeopardize access to care. So basically what they're saying is that if they removed it as a diagnosis, then there wouldn't be anything for insurance to use as a basis for why treatment would be medically necessary. If you don't have a medical diagnosis, you can't get covered by insurance. So what the American Psychiatric Association is saying here is that they kept it as a diagnosis in order to allow people to get medical treatment covered by insurance. But other than that, it's not really a disorder. And finally, Part of removing stigma is about choosing the right words. Replacing disorder with dysphoria in the diagnostic label is not only more appropriate and consistent with familiar clinical sexology terminology, it also removes the connotation that the patient is disordered. I don't think they could be too much more clear about the fact that they don't see gender identity as a disorder or a mental illness or anything that needs to itself be treated. What needs to be treated is the dysphoria that comes about from this incongruence. That's why recommended treatment is about helping people affirm their gender identity and make, take steps to live in, as their most authentic self. In the old days, treatment used to be about getting trans people to let go of these weird deviant behaviors they had and continue to live as their assigned gender. Over time, things have changed and Further studies have shown that treatment which affirms people's gender identity relieves a lot of other mental health issues like depression and anxiety, at least to some degree. In fact, there was a study done last year at the University of Washington that looked at kids and how socially transitioned kids compared to their peers as far as levels of depression and anxiety because it's fairly well known that trans people have a higher rate of depression and anxiety, which is what previously was found in kids as well. But this study, which was published in the March 2016 issue of Pediatrics, which is the journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, concluded that socially transitioned transgender children who are supported in their gender identity have developmentally normative levels of depression and only minimal elevations in anxiety, suggesting that psychopathology is not inevitable within this group. So in other words, having higher levels of depression and anxiety is not a symptom of being trans, it's a symptom of not being affirmed in one's gender identity. So when kids are affirmed and supported by their families and allowed to live as their identified gender, they have normal rates of depression and anxiety. The other thing that I think a lot of people misunderstand is the difference between gender dysphoria and body dysmorphic disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder is when somebody sees a flaw in their appearance, which is either imagined or exaggerated. They become completely obsessed with this aspect of their appearance. It could be their body shape, it could be their skin, it could be their nose, it could be their muscle mass, or really any number of things. It's not just being self-conscious about your appearance. To be diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder, somebody has to have clinically significant levels of distress and obsession over their appearance. Although people with BDD often do pursue surgery and other medical treatments for this flaw that they perceive themselves to have, most of the time this doesn't bring relief of their symptoms. Either they continue to obsess about the same body part, feeling like they had surgery and it either made it worse or it's still not good enough, or they just move to focusing on another body part. Plenty of people have plastic surgery that don't have BDD. In fact, most plastic surgeons do some kind of screening to make sure that their patients or potential patients don't have BDD. Rather than plastic surgery, the recommended treatment for BDD is antidepressants and cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps the person to change the way that they think about their body as opposed to changing their body to match how they think about it. As I just explained, that's at odds with the recommended treatment for gender dysphoria, which is to affirm the person's belief about their body. Now again, I'm not trying to vilify people who have BDD, but it's just a different thing from gender dysphoria. 
Although, of course, there are trans people who have BDD, just like there are trans people who have depression or OCD or schizophrenia or any other number of mental illnesses. So just to recap, the premise of BDD is that the person is seeing a flaw in their appearance, which is either not actually there or is not as significant as they believe it to be. And the recommended treatment is to help them realign their beliefs and their thoughts about their appearance to relieve the discomfort. So in other words, they are totally fine physically how they are. What needs to change is how they think about it. The premise of gender dysphoria, on the other hand, is that the person's ideas and thoughts about their body as it relates to their gender are valid. And the recommended treatment is to change the body to fit the person's beliefs about what the body should be rather than the other way around. The final thing I wanna note before I wrap this up is that there are higher rates of mental health issues in trans people, particularly depression and anxiety. And that's why mental health treatment is part of an overall treatment plan for trans people. There are also aspects of self-acceptance and transition that can benefit from an expert like a gender therapist to guide them through their transition and their understanding of their gender. However, mental health issues that stem from the trans experience are not from the person being trans. It's a reaction to the situation that the person is in. First of all, their body and how they relate to it. And second of all, the stigma in society that we have toward trans people, stigma that can often lead to rejection or even violence toward trans people. So that's the reason why a lot of trans people seek mental health treatment. It's not because being trans is a mental illness, it's because we have all this other stuff to deal with, which is again why I think it's so important to break down the stigma around being trans as well as mental illness. And many trans people find that as they transition socially or medically or however they choose to transition, if at all, they find relief in a lot of their symptoms of depression and anxiety. Now that's not to say that transitioning necessarily will erase depression and anxiety, but transitioning can have a profound positive effect on trans people's mental health. I'm sure this video wasn't completely comprehensive, but I hope I covered at least some of the major points of either misconceptions that you might have had or things that you might come across in social media or in even news media. Like I said, I'll be putting links in the description for all the references I used making this video. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to see more of my future content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.